Welcome everybody to a new young session within our online seminar series Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. We are very happy to come back. And we have today three speakers coming from different places. Uh, and as usual, uh, we will place the, the questions to any of these three speakers uh, until the end. Uh, so, our first speaker is Sandra Benitez Peña, and she's a postdoctoral fellow from Universidad Carlos III de Madrid in Spain. And today, Sandra is going to tell us about uh, a class set approach to data envelopment analysis. The floor is yours, Sandra. Thank you so much for the introduction, Cristina. Well, uh, as she has said, I am going to talk about a cluster approach to data envelopment analysis, mainly focused to the study of, ben of benchmarking. And this is a joint work with Peter Boktov and Dolores Romero Morales from the Copenhagen Business School. Well, this is the outline of my talk. First, I will tell you about a little introduction of this work. I will tell you why we decide to use the cluster and the feature selection, because we need to perform also feature selection. Then I will move to the modelization of clustering and feature selection. First, I will expose a me LMP formulation. Then I will talk to you about some constructive heuristics. Then I will move to look at search heuristic, and after all the methodology is explained, I will uh, show you some numerical results in a simulated data set and also in a real world data set. After all, uh, I will conclude with some remarks and some points for future research. So, regarding the introduction, uh, what is benchmarking? So in benchmarking, we are given a set of K frames, which use all of them the same A inputs and produce the same out outputs. And the performance of the different firms is measured in terms of the output that they produce in relation to the inputs they use. So if they uh, produce a lot of output that uh, consume a few of inputs, it is said that the frame is efficient. Otherwise, uh, the frames uh, will be inefficient. So in benchmarking, the aim is to compare the performance of different frames against others. Which are the different applications here? So uh, we can find benchmarking of electricity distribution system operators. Also, we can find uh, the application in the private or even in the public uh, service. For example, in hospitals, universities, schools, and so on. So one problem that we can find in benchmarking in the different firms that we have is, for example, the heterogeneity. What happened with heterogeneity in this case? We have to answer the questions of, do all the firms, for instance, the hospitals, behave the same? Because we can find, for example, some hospitals that are more focused on her surgeries or maybe on physical therapy. Uh, otherwise, we can find some hospitals that serve to a uh, rural area, so uh, they have not spe specialization. They have uh, to, to know how to treat every disease, whereas uh, maybe there are cities in which we can find so many hospitals, each one with their speciality. So we cannot actually compare the performance of everything against uh, every other. We have to uh, try to find some groups, some clusters. So our proposal here is to develop a novel methodology that finds possible groups of firms that uh, more or less uh, behave the same and have the same properties. And at the same time, we want to find which are the uh, priorities or the characteristics that uh, make those firms to form these groups. And hence, we have to perform a future selection of the relevant outputs and inputs. Regarding this heterogeneity, imagine here this data set. I will select the pointer. Imagine here this data set. 
uh, in benchmarking, the usual is to compare all the firms against the other. So that way, uh, the average efficiency that we can obtain is 0 0.88 and uh, using all the three outputs. However, if we are intelligent and say, okay, here we can see three clear clusters, the red ones, the green ones, and the blue ones. So we can separate in these three clusters. And instead of using the three outputs, we select two outputs for each of the cluster, we can obtain even a higher efficiency. So uh, this is something that, uh, because uh, the, the cluster and the feature selection is important. So now moving to data envelopment analysis, the modelization of our problem. What is uh, data envelopment analysis? Well, data envelopment analysis is a classical tool that it is used in benchmarking and it is based on mathematical optimization. Particularly, uh, the aim measure the performance through an C score, which is this one. It is an average, uh, a weight average of the outputs and a weight average of the inputs, where, as I have said, X are the inputs, Y are the outputs, and beta and alpha are the different weights for these averages. In such a way that those firms uh, whose quotient, whose efficiency score is equal to one, are said to be the efficient ones. So something about DEA, DEA, as you have seen in the previous formulation, can deal with multiple performance measures, both inputs and outputs in a single integrated model. And it also identifies a baseline for comparisons in continuous improvement program and provides a specific target for improvement. Let's say when we compare, we can say, okay, you have to reduce this number of inputs in order to produce uh, this quantity of output if you want to be efficient compared uh, to this other one. So this is the formulation for the data envelopment analysis because, well, the efficiency is calculated as that quotient, but we have to solve the values of the betas and the alphas, and it is solved like that. However, uh, this formulation uses all the outputs and all the inputs, and we don't want so because we want to obtain interpretability and so. so we can perform feature selection here you can see an example in which we move uh, from a uh, o equal to one output until o equal to 10 outputs and something that we can see in this picture is that well as we know the dea problem maximizes the individual and also the joint efficiencies as the number of outputs in the data set increases here is something that we can see in the box plus also in practice, we can see, we can have so many outputs and inputs and few frames, so uh, we can obtain something like overfitting and so on. And as usual in the real world data set, the cost of obtaining the different inputs and outputs can be expensive and some of them can be redundant and can explain more or less the same. And finally, the interpretation, and as I, as I have said before, can be difficult if we use many inputs and outputs. So in order to reduce this number of inputs and outputs, we propose in this uh, published paper with uh, the author that I mentioned before, uh, this new formulation of the DEA in which we reduce number of future. We uh, have here this constraint we said that the number of outputs to select is equal to P. It can be also modeled the number of inputs, the number of outputs and inputs at the same time, and so So now uh, I have explained how we can perform the feature selection, but now we have to move to the cluster section. So first I am going to show you which is the formulation that we propose to perform simultaneously the clustering and the feature selection. So uh, the idea for this formulation is that we want to perform at the same time feature selection and clustering in the DMUs, in the firms. Also, uh, regarding the clustering, we want to separate all the firms into two or more groups. 
uh, uh, performing the feature selection technique in the uh, inputs or in the outputs inside the, cl the cluster. And something relevant for this clustering and feature selection is that the selected inputs and outputs have to be the same uh, within the cluster, but might differ by cluster. So the formulation that we obtain is uh, something like this, in which we impose the number of outputs in this case to be lower or equal than PR. Since we try to maximize this uh, objective function, uh, this constraint will tend to be equal, not less, but exactly equal. So here uh, we model the number of outputs and here with these variables, bi uh, these binary variables, gamma, we select if uh, each firm go goes to one cluster or to other. So here we have the constraints in which we say for every cluster from one to C, we want every firm to be exactly just in uh, one cluster. Something that we can see in here in this formulation is that we have the big M's, M1 and M2. And well, we have uh, some discussions about the values of the M2 and the F1 in order to impose uh, some higher values for, for the value, because if we impose uh, lower values for these big M's, we can uh, like avoid a good solution. And if we use very large values of these values M's, uh, we can obtain some numerical results. So we want to obtain good solutions, but without numerical errors. Here the same discussion for in one, so we obtain some upper bounds for these values. And now regarding constructive heuristics, because the problem before can be sometimes uh, difficult to solve. Uh, we can uh, have the constructive heuristic based on primal similarity, on dual similarity, and similarity in the efficiency level. To see it uh, better, here we have some pictures. So imagine that this axis is uh, a, a one output, and this another axis is another output. So uh, we can see uh, more or less uh, here one cluster and here one cluster, the red one and the blue ones. So if we don't perform any feature selection, uh, the average efficiency will be uh, less than one. But if we try to uh, put uh, the red in one cluster and the blue in one cluster, we uh, can obtain a higher efficiency. The dual similarity, it doesn't work like the previous before in which the cluster were formed just by distance, but here uh, we have to solve first the DEA model, and then once uh, we have solved it, we are going to perform the cluster, but now based on the values beta and alpha, uh, the different weights that we have obtained, no, on the original values of the outputs and the inputs. And the, another one, the efficiency similarity. Here we have also to, to perform DEA, and then we have to obtain the different efficiencies. So here we can see how uh, the different efficiencies are equal to one for these three and equal to uh, 0 0.5 for these three. But if we separate in this cluster in red and this cluster in blue, we can obtain all these three uh, DMUs to have an efficiency equal to one, and all these in blue uh, also to have an efficiency equal to one, just separating by clusters. And the heuristic for the uh, for the similarity in the efficiencies can be modeled. It is not just yeah, performing a k-means or that, but uh, here we can model it. For that, we have to impose uh, the lowest efficiency that we want to obtain, and the model will select the k more relevant, so it will separate between the efficient and the not efficient, and uh, 
when we perform this uh, selection, we only can build uh, two clusters, the selected and the non-selected. So if we want to obtain three or more clusters, it's just a repeated procedure. We have to select first between the more efficient and the less efficient. Then in the group of the less efficient, we have to separate again between the more efficient ones and the less efficient and repeat uh, on the number of clusters that we want. And after that, uh, we can go to the local search heuristic in the case that the other one, the constructive heuristics, uh, doesn't work properly. So in the local search heuristic, what we do is, once we have uh, found the different clusters, we try to move uh, one DMU from one cluster to uh, one of uh, to the other cluster, making both a swap or just a single movement so uh, we can try to improve the results that we obtain by uh, changing the different frames of clusters. And now going to the numerical results. Uh, these are the uh, requirements of the system in which I have uh, run the different experiments. First, I use a simulated data set in which I use a K equal to 150 uh, firms. I have used three outputs, so it is easy to represent them in a 3D uh, picture. I have used Y equal to one, uh, only one input. And also I have to say that this input is uh, the same for everything. So we have just to focus on the values of the outputs. And also, uh, as you can see in the picture, data has been built. So using three different clusters, maybe you can see in these uh, different lines, the, the three different clusters of 50 DMUs each and two outputs in each cluster. Let's say in this picture, we have only to use output two and output three. For this cluster, we have only to use output uh, three and output one and so on. So, uh, as I have said, uh, using three output, uh, three clusters, sorry, and two outputs, we can make every firm to be efficient. And all the contents uh, M1 and M2 has to be sent equal to uh, 10 of the power of five. So, these are the different results that we obtain. These are uh, the results for two clusters and pay the number of outputs from one to three. As we can see, if we use uh, two clusters and uh, three outputs, we can obtain a really high result. These are the clusters that had to be formed when you see t equal to, say, c equal to two and uh, p equal to three. Also, for uh, three clusters using our original approach and moving from p equal to one to three, when we uh, use the p equal to two, we uh, can obtain the one of uh, here, uh, it has not been possible. And also using P to three, uh, we can obtain the one. Also, uh, it cannot be possible here because uh, some numerical problems and the time limit and so on. But here uh, we can see the picture when we use C equal to three and P equal to two. So we can see more or less here uh, this cluster, but there are some uh, points in black that should be in green. Here, all the uh, blacks, so uh, it is a correct cluster, and here in red, so it is a correct cluster. So just swapping or moving these uh, uh, black points into the green, we can obtain an average efficiency equal to one. Also, I have run here uh, C equal to three using the k-means. In P equal to one, uh, it is true that we obtain higher efficiency that with uh, our original approach and with uh, C equal to two, which is expected. But also maybe in P equal to two and three, we may obtain the one, but uh, here we have a stop at 0 0.9 and 0 0.98. Maybe uh, using the approach of the local search, we can go uh, until the one. And now, uh, finally, uh, without using cluster, we can see that uh, the higher efficiency that we can obtain, 0 0.8. Now moving to the Andra, real world data. Yeah. One minute. 
Okay. Okay. So I'm going to the conclusions. <laughs> So looking at the real world data set, it's more or less the same. So as a conclusion, we have developed a model that combines feature selection and cluster as a means integer linear programming problem. We have investigated a simulated data set and a real one. And also we have gained an interesting insight relative to the festiveness of allowing more cluster or more features. Also, we have suggested uh, several heuristic that one can use. And um, finally, some future lines of research are the interpretability of the clusters, combine or approach with interpretability constraints, and start this approach for outliers detention. And <laughs> yes, that's all. <laughs> Sorry for the time. And um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Sandra. You were uh, you, you were on time finally. <laughs> uh, so I recall the audience uh, that we will place all the questions uh, to any of the speakers at the end, right? Okay, so our, thank you, Sandra. Our next speaker is Donato Maragno, a PhD student from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and he's going to talk us about mixed integer optimization with constraint learning. All yours, uh, Donato. Thank you, Christina, for introducing me. Do you hear me well? Yes. Uh, yeah, great. So, yeah, thank you, Christina, and thank you also, Senia and uh, Senia, uh, Dolores and Emilio, for making this seminar possible. Today, I'm going to talk about mixed integer optimization with constraint learning, which is a joint project with uh, some people from MIT and uh, my supervisors at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, okay, I will. Yeah. So before I go into constraint learning, first of all, I will I would like to mention briefly what mixed integer optimization is, even if I assume that most of you know what it is. So it's actually a tool, a powerful tool to optimize a given objective function subject to some constraints. And uh, one of the most known optimization problems is the traveling season problem, where we have to find the, the route for a set of cities to visit a set of cities such that we visit each city once and we go back to the regional point. So this is an optimization problem and it is used so many times in real life for solving many different problems. Sometimes though there are real life optimization problems where functions or either objective function or constraints are not explicit which means that we don't have a function for it and we don't know how to describe it in a re realistic way. But when data is available, we can make use of it. We can learn using machine learning models the constraint or the objective function and try to embed it into the optimization model. Now, from now on in the presentation, I'm going to just talk about constraint learning, but it actually extends to the objective function as well. All right, uh, let me give you immediately an example. And this is an example in the WFP, in the World Food Program setting. What we have here is an optimization model where the decision variable is a food basket. So we want to optimize the food basket sub subject to some constraints, uh, like the nutrient requirement constraints, and then we minimize a procurement cost objective function. Now we know how to define the objective function, we know how to define the nutrient requirement constraints, but we have an extra constraint, which is about the palatability of the food basket. And the palatability depends on many different factors like the culture or people, sim yeah, simply the people taste. And by palatability, I mean how well people know how to cook it and how much they enjoy the food. And so the palatability is a function of the food basket x and then i say that my palatability has to be greater than a threshold t now this function the palatability function it's something that we can learn whenever we have data about uh, how people like the different types of food baskets so what we can do is we can use constraint learning the idea here is that we have some decision variables x some contextual variables uh, w for example 
the, the country where people come from. And then we have uh, Y, which is the predicted outcome or outcomes if we have more than one. And using the previous example, which is actually a running example, I'm going to use it for the rest of the slides. Uh, y is the palatability that we want to learn. Now, as you can see, that's my conceptual model. I have to minimize a function, which might be a function of a y, but also x and w. Then I have some constraints. And then my y, uh, the predicted outcome, is learned using a data set d. And the machine learning model that can be used is, uh, yeah, it's actually one of many different machine learning models that can be represented using linear functions. And sometimes we need binary variables. But I will show you later how to do it in more details. Uh, constraint learning is a really hot topic nowadays. There are many papers that make use of it. Here uh, we wrote together with uh, Dick Denertog and uh, Adifa Jamisin a survey about optimization with constraint learning. And in this table here, we can see so many different uh, papers that uh, use constraint learning. And the way they learn constraints might be in different ways. So in the columns, you have different machine learning models like neural networks or uh, ensembles of trees. And among these papers, there is also the one I'm going to talk about today, where we actually make use, we present how to embed all the most known machine learning models. OK, the framework that we present in the paper is the following one. We have the conceptual model. And the conceptual model is actually uh, what we know how to define. So we have decision variables. We have contextual variables, some parameters. And then we have all the known constraints and objective function. And then, of course, we need an idea of what has to be learned. For example, we know that a palatability must be learned at some point. But we don't know what is actually the function defining the, the, the palatability. So in this case, we have some data for the palatability. We pre-process the data. And then the next step is to learn some constraints, the constraints for the palatability. The nice part here is that we, there is no model dominance assumption, which means that the machine learning model that will be used to learn the constraint is not fixed a priori, but it's something that we can decide based on the performance of the, the machine learning model. Then something else is the trust region. And this is something crucial for the optimization. But I will show you later where it comes into play. And then we combine the conceptual model with the learned constraints and with the trust region to optimize a final optimization model. OK, here there is a list of machine learning models that we can represent using linear functions and uh, binary variables. So we have a linear logistic regression, but also more complicated one like neural networks with a real activation function. And yeah, to be redundant, what we have here is, again, our conceptual model with functions that we know how to define. And then we have another constraint like the palatability that we want to learn. And the palatability is, for example, learned using a linear regression. And so what happens is that we fit our machine learning model, our linear regression, we get the vector beta and beta 0. And we use this function here to describe my outcome, learn outcome y. And then we can say that y has to be greater than a treasure. Now, that's actually the simple case of a linear regression. When we talk about decision tree, it's actually pretty similar. Now, imagine that this decision tree is a binary problem. It's a binary model. So, uh, using the same example, the palatability now, it's a food basket is either palatable or not. So we train our machine learning model, our decision tree, and that's what we get. So this is the trained model. We have four leaves, and only two, the blue ones, are palatable, which means my X, if is able to reach one of the blue leaves, then it's predicted as palatable. Otherwise, it will be not palatable. So how can I force the palatability into the optimization model? One way to do it is using, is like reaching, forcing the X to reach this leaf. And this is done including these constraints into the optimization. Because if I use this constraint to reach P3, my leaf P3, it means that my X decision variable can go only in this path. 
and then it means that it's palatable because we are we are we are able to reach this lid. On the other end, I can get a palatable food basket also reaching leaf P6. And this is this other set of constraints. Now, of course, uh, one possible way to get a solution is to solve two different uh, linear problems, mm, the one including P3, the one including P6. And then the optimal solution will be the best one among the two, between the two. Or when the tree is really deep, or we use an assemble of trees, we, what we can do actually is to use binary variables. So we can solve just one optimization mo model where we describe each feasible leaf using binary variables. Um, another machine learning model that can be represented using linear functions and binary variables is a neural network with a real activation function. And the real activation function is the one that you see here. So for this node, for the blue one, the output will be the max between zero and a linear combination of the output of the previous layer. So as you can see, is a piecewise linear function, this neural network with the uh, real activation function. And the way we can describe it is using this set of five constraints plus a binary variable Z, which is one way to do it. This is not really efficient because we use some uh, big M, a big M formulation, but there are some other approaches in the literature, like the one proposed by Anderson et al, where they use an iterative cut generation procedure to get um, the same solution, of course, but in a much faster way. Okay, now going back, going to the next topic, which is about the trust region. We have this, imagine that we have this data set here. So each food basket is one of these dots. And for simplicity, we only have two different foods that define my food basket. And we have meat and oil. And each one is labeled as palatable or not. So that's an ideal case where we can actually train a machine learning model like a decision tree and get a training performance equal to one. So the best score and my feasible space is described by these two constraints. The oil has to be less than 15 and the meat has to be greater than 100. Okay, so that's what my tree is uh, telling me. So if I use these constraints in, into the optimization model, and then I have also another constraint like uh, the, the green uh, line here, like a nutrient requirement constraints, so something that I know how to define. And then we minimize the objective function, which points in this direction, of course, because we want to minimize the amount of food to minimize the cost of the food basket. What we get is as optimal solution, the one, the star that you see here. But is it really palatable? Can we actually claim that it's palatable? I mean, according to the decision tree, we are in the, in the feasible, in the palatable leaf, but it's actually really far from what we have seen in the trainings phase, right? So uh, when the data is distributed. So a better approach that we propose is to use some trust region constraints. And basically these constraints are describing a convex hull around my data set. We don't need to find the convex hull, which is something extremely expensive in terms of uh, complexity and time, but we can describe a feasible solution as a convex combination of points. And this is done by using this set of linear constraints which is extremely fast in practice. And so here, what we have is that a feasible solution to be, to be a solution to be feasible as to respect my, um, the constraints coming from the tree, my nutrient requirement constraint, and also my trust region constraint. So the optimal solution now is again, palatable according to the tree is also much closer to what we have seen in the data set. So I can have more, much more trust in the machine learning model. And this formulation that you see here on the right, again, is extremely fast, but when the number of data points is huge, so we talk about uh, millions of data points, it might be slow. It's actually slow because the number of lambda that we have here and lambda is a variable now, is equal to the number of data points, big N, capital N. 
So it means that if my data points as 1 million data, when my, my data set has 1 million data points, I also have 1 million variables in the optimization model. So what we propose is to use a column selection algorithm. And the column selection algorithm works such that I start from a subset of points, and then I find the convex all of these points, like the red ones here in the picture, um, here. And then iteratively, I look for a new point in my data set to enlarge the convex cell. And then I will stop when my optimal solution, the black star here, is included in the convex cell, in the red convex cell, which is not exactly the convex cell of my full data set. It's just part of it, but it's the part that I care about. So this actually improves a lot the computation time and we are also something like 10 times faster. Uh, something else that I forgot to mention about, it's about clustering. And this is actually when mm, we have data that is spread, it's, it's, there is not actually um, a uniform distribution of data, but I have some clusters, which, which means that there are low density region in the convex cell. And the question is, again, do we trust the, 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 the predictive model in this empty region here? So what we suggest is to use first clustering, and then for each cluster, we define a convex cell. And we force the optimal solution to be in one of these uh, convex cells. That's the, I, the idea. Everything I talked about so far has been developed in Python. So at this link, you can find the package where you can use constraint learning. You can use optical, which stands for optimization with constraint learning to train the constraints or the objective function. You can learn one or more constraints. You can learn constraints and objective function using some data. And then uh, optical would take care of embedding these constraints into the optimization. So it's a pretty a uh, nice way to learn constraints. Mm, everything is based on uh, scikit-learn uh, for the learning part and Pyoma is for the optimization part, for modeling the optimization model. There is also a demo available, but yeah, uh, for this one actually, I mean, I will need other 10 minutes, so probably there is no time, but if you are curious, you can just have a look at the GitHub repository, you will find it there. So this was my presentation. I think, uh, yeah, if you have questions, probably at the end of the next talk. Yes. Thank you, yes. Donato, for your nice presentation. We, we will go now for our last speaker, Yuri Malitsky. Uh, he's an assistant professor in applied mathematics from Linköping University in Sweden and he will talk to us uh, about adaptive uh, gradient descent without descent. The floor is yours, uh, Yuri. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot to organizers for inviting me here. Um, hope I will, uh, I, will, I will manage it to be in time, but if not, just interrupt me if, if I miss a uh, deadline. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I will talk about uh, a recent paper, Adaptive Gradient Descent Without Descent. Uh, it's a recent paper with Konstantin Tenko. Uh, you, can, you can see the, the, the link there if you're interested to find out more details. Uh, so in, in the talk, we will, we will uh, study the basic optimization problem. We have some nice uh, convex and differentiable function f and uh, we uh, want to minimize it. So it's unconstrained problem. And since it's such a basic problem, of course, there are plenty of methods how, how we can solve it. For example, uh, for example, yeah, so there is gradient descent, there is, and many, many extensions of gradient descent, like accelerated gradient descent, Newton method, the method when we assume certain uh, availability of uh, other oracle. We can go back and assume less, for example, by considering stochastic methods or coordinate. Important, important here is that gradient descent is like a backbone of all these maps. So if we, uh, if we can understand well gradient descent, 
maybe we can do also something nice with, with other methods. The gradient descent is an old method. It goes 19th century to, uh, to Cauchy. There are many like ma major papers on, on, on the way. And uh, for uh, throughout the talk, we will use extensively the following definition. We will call function uh, f L smooth, is equivalent. Sometimes we will call that gradient is a Lipschitz when this inequality holds for for all x and y, of course, uh, of all space. So there, it, it means that we have some control uh, over gradient changes. It cannot change too fast, right? If if our function f is two times differentiable, it's it's the same as to say that Hessian is bounded by constant L. The normal the Hessian is bounded by by, by L. Uh, okay, so the basic classical result is as follows. So if our function is convex and L smooth, we use the step size alpha. Alpha is a, this constant alpha is a step size. So if alpha is small enough, in particular if it's less than two over L, we can prove uh, we can prove conversions to a minimizer. If we example, if we pick step size like one over L. Uh, we can like uh, quanti quanti quantize uh, the rate exactly. Uh, so in particular for for en for our energy for function values, x star is a, our solution. We have one over k rate. It's not important this complicated expression for us. It's just important that it's one over k. Maybe it's good to remember that in the nominator we have this constant l. So probably it would be better for me to write l over k, not to include both. So that, that's the that's basic result. Uh, okay, so method is very simple to, to implement, but if we, uh, there is one, one, one thing. So assume that we have some convex fun function that which we want to mi minimize. Uh, and our argument x, they, they, they live on a plane, our function is like, a, and the function values live in the zeta space, as a third dimension. So we, we can construct the level set of our function f. Since it's convex, it may look something like that. So we, we are at the point blue. We, we are in the blue point. We want to find the red 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 star, uh, the solution. And we if we are going to okay, so we are going to run gradient descent. If we if we pick small enough step size, then yeah, indeed we we converge to the point. To this one. If we, on the other hand, if we pick it very small, then probably this convergence will take many more iterations. Because of that, it will be more expensive, of course. On the other hand, if we if we use larger step size, uh, we might just divert. So we just go into this region and and we'll jump from one region to another and go to infinity like that. That's that's why that like picking this step size is is not trivial. And in other way, the way, until the method is very simple, we still need to know how to find the step size alpha. It's not a uh, free lunch. And so what we're going to do. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, as I said, it's a it's really old method. So apparently there, there are already a lot of existing approaches to um, uh, for, for, for this issue. So one. The most, the most like general probably is to use line search. Line search is another whole loop you have to run in every iteration. In particular, in every iteration k, start with some step size, with some guess, whatever, whatever it's not important. Um, and we, 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 we compute xk plus one, next iteration, compute it, and we check whether this inequality holds for some constant c. It's not important. If this inequality holds, meaning that we, we have some decrease in our energy, our f decrease, decrease, then we break this for loop and say, okay, that the step size we tried was good, and we go to the next iteration. If this iteration doesn't hold, go back, decrease step size alpha, and do the same. So eventually, if our function f satisfies the assumption we talked about, then eventually f must uh, the, the step size must set, must satisfy this inequality in the end, and uh, so it will always break this for loop. Uh, 
Well, that, that's that's pretty reliable procedure, and if you have no idea which step size to use, probably it's a it's a good thing to 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 do. On the other hand, it's it's clear that this procedure is is more expensive than gradient descent, in particular. Uh, yeah, like in every iteration, we need not one evaluation of gradient, but um, probably many more. We don't know, and actually we don't even know how many. We cannot say about the complexity how many iterations uh, of the gradient we will need in the end. Uh, another another approach is very good one is uh, to use Polex step size. This is uh, a version of gradient descent in the following form. So use your peak step size alpha k, uh, strange equation, f star is of an optimal value, and you, you, you use it. This method is quite good, but un unfortunately, it requires us to know the optimal value. In, in only a few problems uh, that I interested in practice where we indeed know f, f star in general, the constant is not available to us. So that's, that's why it's not very practical. But if you know F star, it's really a good idea to try the product step size. Uh, finally, there is a popular Brazil library vein step size, which goes as follows. It's quite complicated uh, formula, but no, I mean, it, it ju you just take current gradient, previous one, and do some expression and use it in, in the update. So this step size was proposed for quadratic problems. Unfortunately, it, it actually, the theory only works for quadratic case, and you can construct a nice, uh, nice convex function, like even strongly convex, where uh, this method will fail, or even like modification of this method will fail. So it's not reliable. So that's that's like one few few most important options. Uh, with, 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 with which you can handle the, the issue of the step size. But it's, as, as we discussed, all of them have their drawbacks. So, uh, so now we will describe what, what we propose. Again, we, we recall that we will, we will assume that function f is uh, L smooth. Uh, if you, and our, our method is a simple modification of gradient descent where we pick step size adaptively. So if you don't know, um, you just want like to invent some heuristic and you don't know constant L, probably, and you know that the step size must be proportional to this constant L, kind of. Like it, it, will, it will be good if it's proportional. So uh, an naive idea is to try this gradient descent where you define step size like a proportional uh, to one over L, where L is your local constant to click of uh, your local Lipschitz constant it's a, a ratio between different gradients and values. That's that's a very naive idea. It, and actually, if you if you have some concrete problem, you may try and it will work. So it's it's pretty actually it makes sense. Fortunately, it's also not that hard to find these counterexamples. That's why we propose a, a new method which will work reliably. Uh, and uh, but as you see, it's not that different from this naive approach. It's it's a bit more complicated the, the update, but on the other hand, not much. So the the main difference is the step size. On the one hand, it's also one over two L, but on the other hand, we control how quickly alpha k can change from one iteration to another. How fast it can grow and grow, right? Because the square root is bigger than one, so alpha k can be bigger than alpha k minus one. But we must define how, how, how much it can be big and how much time. And theta is just some, the, the ratio between step sizes. That's, that's, that's not important. So it's important that on one hand, alpha k is approximation of local Lipschitzness, and another, we control how quickly it changes. So we will consider in more details in the next slide. And the iteration k, we assume that we have, uh, we have xk. And we have a gradient, uh, and uh, theta, theta k minus one. So what we are going to do? Uh, we compute compute our gradient at a point x k. Reuse the previous already computed gradient at point x k minus one, and with this we compute constant l k, like a local Lipschitzness. 
and and then this is informa information we proceed to compute alpha k so alpha k is just a simple substitution that doesn't require any expensive things to do and computing after we compute alpha k we go and update our iterates xk we compute xk plus one and after that we update some some simple parameters like uh, theta k basically in terms of computation, it's the same as gradient descent. You just need to uh, compute one gradient per iteration. You don't need anything else, no values of f. And in the other hand, uh, it's just some way to adapt it, adaptively pick uh, step size alpha k. Uh, in particular, we can, uh, in, in particular, yeah, it, I wrote it in, in, in three lines now. I, instead of writing LK, I substituted this long, long expression into alpha K. Uh, so you may, you may wonder why we have such strange conditions, at least the square root and this one. So I cannot explain it really well without show, showing the proof, but the main idea is that I have the proof of all this optimization method works. In most cases, you construct some um, discrete of energy, like the same you do in uh, with solving uh, differential equations. You construct some weapon of energy and show that it increases along iterates. So here you do the same. You construct some energy and you show that along iterates of your method, uh, it, uh, this, this energy doesn't increase. Or, or it either stays the same or decreases. So in this case, we construct such some strange energy, CK plus one, quite different from, from common in optimization uh, area. We, what we want to do, we want to, we want to show that we want to show this inequality. Unfortunately, if we just write CK plus one and CK, it, 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 it will be some, some nonsense. This is, it, it's difficult to, com to compare them. So there will be some extra terms uh, that we have to kill. These extra terms will be exactly uh, those that appear in the algorithm. So the, the first term uh, denoted in red is like that. And if you, if you see it's actually why step size alpha k has to be smaller than this number, uh, just to make this red, red part negative. And similar, you want to do this with, uh, uh, similarly, you want to do it for, uh, for the second term. It's a green one. Yes, you want to make it because fx k minus one minus fx star is always positive. You want to make green term negative. And this is, I mean, it's not immediately clear, but if you just like write uh, in, in two lines, you immediately obtain the same uh, inequality that alpha k has to be less than the square root and uh, multiply by alpha k minus one. Uh, so that's, that's just intuition why we. Uh, how we, uh, we came up with such strange update, kind of uh, natural. So what we can prove? If we assume that f is convex and not just not locally and not not globally ellipses as we assumed before, we assume only local ellipses gradient f, which is much more general. For example, functions like uh, xp exponential uh, tangents. Uh, they 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 do not satisfy property of to to be uh, to have global Lipschitz gradient, but for us it's it's fine. Like the, all all of these functions are locally Lipschitz, uh, so we can see a more general class of functions. So that that's enough for our purposes. So if you assume this, we can prove as before convergence to a solution, and moreover we will have the following rate for some x k ergodic sequence. Uh, we will have some constant divided over sum of step size, and we can show that it's also one over k rate uh, in the worst case. But since we have no, no some uh, concrete uh, alpha uh, i step size and alpha other step size were chosen in an adaptive way, uh, so practical point of view, we may hope that this alpha. Uh, I am much larger than the global estimate that the global constant of uh, global Lipschitz constant provided us. So in practice, it may be much much better. Practice. Why we have one over k? Uh, because uh, if, for example, if you assume just for simplicity, we don't need, but for simplicity, if you assume that uh, gradient is a Lipschitz, 
and you can prove that all of the step size are actually bounded by some of this constant one over two L. And because of the, because we have some of the step size, we obtain K in the denominator. That's how we get one over K in the worst case. Uh, okay, let's quickly see how it works. For example, the, this is like a, some typical uh, logistic regression, a typical problem with uh, uh, one of the like popular data sets. So compare gradient descent. Uh, we compare Nestor method that probably works faster than gradient descent. That, that it, its rate is one over k square. And uh, and we, 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 we so we compare this to classical methods with, with ours. Both three methods use the same number, uh, use just one one gradient per iteration. And as you see, in other method, also other method has rate one over k. It's still much faster in practice. There are many more experiments in the paper. I will not go into this. And basically, I have to finish right now. So yeah, I just quickly go. There are some extensions. I will go into this. So there are some open questions if you're interested in. Uh, so th because if you if you ha have something, if you prove something for extension of gradient descent, now it's tempting to do the same for for other variants for of gradient descent. So that's my that's what open questions are about. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. If you have questions, you can ask a bit later. Thank you, Yuri, for the excellent uh, presentation. Um, yeah, so um, as I realized, uh, your method is uh, uh, more efficient and faster than uh, the others. It was uh, very impressed. So, but uh, now, yeah, we want to open the floor for the questions to all the speakers. So, if you want to ask the question, uh, then you can raise the hand and we will uh, give you rights to to talk or you can uh, use the chat so yeah there's a okay there is a question from Ilker. or it was a misclick i don't know i'm sorry it was a misclick okay <laughs> okay great Okay, we have a question from Nagisa. So let's give, yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, thanks. C can you hear me now? Yes, yes, oh, excellent. Oh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question for the very last presentation given by Yuri. I hope I pronounced correctly. Um, yeah, great. I was I was thinking like it's like a really kind of uh, strong method and like the idea was very fascinating and uh, I was thinking is it do you think it's easy to extend to the case where we don't have a exact gradient or like function value like let's say stochastic gradient descent doesn't use like a exact one then uh, exactly so in my slide I I, uh, I I show some experiments with stochastic gradient descent unfortunately. Uh -huh. And we did many experiments in the paper. Unfortunately, unfortunately uh, we presented as a heuristic. We we couldn't prove anything for this method. But still, surprisingly, we applied it even for non-convex, like some deep learning, deep uh, training, deep learning, and it worked pretty well. And what is interesting, oh. it gave us really large step size. My idea is that some state of the art is GD, uh, and it. In spite of that, we still uh, like showed even better results. So we don't understand this phenomena. And not, uh -huh. uh, it's it's not the same across all the data sets, but very often we, we observe this. I see. So and so, like, uh, uh, we, uh, so you try to kind of analyze the stochastic version as well, but like it was not really easy. Like uh, analysis. Uh, to, to, we, we even have some proof, but like the, that uh -huh. theorem that is not interested. It's like it doesn't provide any benefits. It's just like it's I possible see. to prove in the convex case. In practice, uh -huh. it might work. It's just like we don't know how to analyze in in theory this. Like, in a, this is a better I way. Uh, thank you. Thank you Thanks for the answering. Yeah, Any other questions? So, oh, may I ask uh, Donato about? 
Um, so you told something about the long trees, but I, uh, as I understood, long trees, it's not what you want have and also you can have not uh, only one feature in the node so you can have uh, uh, let's say oblique cuts in your nodes is it correct or I sorry you can have what and it's the connection you can have oh uh, guess, sorry so um, is your uh, does your decision trees have uh, oblique cuts or it's uh, only oh, yeah. one feature in the node yeah, actually, uh, it's not important. We can have also split cuts, so we can have multiple features involved in each uh, cut, each split. So that's uh, not a problem. And what we ac actually see that is when we have uh, oblique cuts, then we can get similar performances with uh, a shallow tree instead of a, instead of a deep tree. And having a deep tree is actually not something that we dislike. Uh, it might be a problem for the optimization, though, because then we have to introduce binary variables. And if the problem is itself a linear programming problem, then usually we don't have binary variables. But when the tree is deep, then we need to introduce them. Otherwise, the number of optimization problems that we have to solve is equal to the number of, let's say, positive leaves or number of leaves that we actually are caring about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, I know that the classes you have uh, in each leaf, it's not the same classes as in, um, uh, let's say, usual uh, machine learning task. But uh, what I, d I don't know, is there, a need, is there a need to have, for example, more classes than only two? Or it's uh, more like to split your, to make a functional form? So you have, you need to. You mean classes in the, in the, prediction problem. Yeah. So um, now the package that uh, we developed is just for binary classification, but the theory that we present in the paper is for both actually. So we can also use multi-class classification. Um, itself, the formulation is, uh, it's nothing special. It's pretty the same. Um, so I will say that when we actually deal with real problem, then we have to see how it performs. And not only from a prediction point of view, so not only in terms of accuracy, but also when we embed it into the optimization, because what we see is that optimizing is actually, most of the time, we are looking for points, feasible solutions that are trying to fool the machine learning model. Because if you think about the, the, the case study that I presented, we have the palatability that somehow goes in an opposite direction compared to the objective function. So the objective function is pushing the optimization in a certain point that the predictive model is not performing well. And so we have a misclassification or a misprediction. That's why we introduced the trust region idea. So uh, now to go back to the question, I will say that binary or multi-class classification depends on the problem. Um, we can make a multi-class problem binary, and but sometimes when multi-class performs better, then we can keep it. And the, yep. yeah, there's a pretty similar formulation for it. I see. Okay, and just a small question, last, the last one from my side. So um, I didn't get it from the formulation, but uh, are you doing this uh, uh, machine learning uh, of the uh, constraints and the optimization simultaneously, or you have two steps? It's actually two steps. So the first step is mm, two big steps. So the first step is we train the machine learning models. We train different models. At least this is actually how optical works. But you can choose. You can train these machine learning models. You see the performance. You choose the best one. And then afterwards, you can embed the constraints into the optimization model, and then you solve the optimization model. So the idea is that you don't know what's the function that you are learning. You don't know what's the structure of the function, but you're learning it. But again, you are learning the function, which means that you are learning, you're fitting some parameters during the training, but those parameters are fixed when you go to the optimization. So mm -hmm. it's actually two steps. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so it's uh, your data actually. Yeah. Uh to the optimization model. Thank you very much uh, for this clar clarification. Thank you. So um, if any other questions, we are um, 
you have time to ask? I, I don't know, it seems to me um, there's no questions. Um, so I don't know, I may, yeah, we can close the session then and uh, uh, say great thank to all of our speakers. It was very interesting and it was from very different, uh, not very different, but uh, yes, it, a little bit different areas. So uh, a lot of uh, food for our minds <laughs> from today's seminar. Um, so thank you very much and uh, see you next uh, Monday. Um, it's going to be uh, a usual seminar series with uh, one speaker. So, but thank you very much for participating in this uh, excellent event. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank everybody. You. <laughs> thank you.